Praise the Lord. He has risen. Risen indeed. Risen indeed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Could you stand with us as we worship this morning? Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 57th verse says this, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you may have, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the, the world. Amen? Amen. He has overcome the world. That's why we're here today to sing about the victory that Jesus has done. Amen? Thank you. 
Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You overcome. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You overcome. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father.
son was dead, the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon me. Sing 
this morning? music. Come on down. I want to invite my young friends to join me right up front here. I've got a word just for you. How are you today? What day is today? Easter. Yes. Very good. Good morning. Hey. Did any of you um, have anything to do with Easter eggs today? Has anyone, not yet, not yet? Anybody look, go looking for Easter eggs today yet? You did, all right. You know, when I was your age, um, nowadays we use these plastic ones, right? It's probably when we fill them with all kind of stuff. When I was your age, we get actually bought real live, you know, the eggs, and we had to color them ourselves. You kind of dip them in this um, stuff that, in it that would just, it was kind of stinky to tell you the truth, and a lot of different colors, and it would be a, a real egg inside. It was kind of nice because then afterward we eat them, but uh, you really can't eat these too well, can you? Well, I did bring along four Easter eggs this morning, and they're, they're really kind of special eggs. Um, the first one, there's something inside. What do you think's inside? Whoa, what's this? What is that? What is it? It's a cross, exactly. And the cross is there to remind us that Jesus loved us. He, he loved us enough to decide to pick up the cross and carry it be, that we might know freedom from our sin. So there's the cross in the first one to remind us of His love and that, that no one made Him go to the cross. He decided for us to do that. Here's the second one. What could be in here? What are these? Anyone? Nails. Excellent. And this reminds us that Jesus was nailed to the cross with nails. And they weren't, by the way, the, the nails they used on him were not this small, right? They were really huge, really huge nails. And they nailed him to the cross. And you think that hurt? Yeah, it hurt a lot. It hurt a lot. And Jesus went through a lot of hurt, in other words, to save us. He really decided to do that out of love for us. Uh-oh. This has got something else in it. What is this? What is it? A stone, yes, or a rock. And the Bible tells us that when they buried Jesus, they put him in a tomb, and, behind, and they closed the tomb with a huge, not this little small one, but a huge rock. They had to roll it into place. And they did that. To, they wanted to try and keep him in there. Um, and it reminds us that sometimes we have even huge stones in our lives that can get in the way of, of our knowing the freedom that we can know. The last one, what's in here? Nothing. It's empty. It reminds us, the Bible tells us that when the ladies went to the tomb, they found the tomb empty, that Jesus was risen, that he'd gone out of it. And so together they remind us that Jesus willingly took up the cross for us, that he, but he could not be held on the cross with the nails. He lives, and that he couldn't be held by the rock behind in the grave. He lives. The Bible tells us that everyone who believes in him will go to heaven with him, will have everlasting life. And that's what we believe. Let me pray with you for a moment, that I have a gift for you. Father, I thank you for your love and your grace, that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, but even more, to be raised for us, to give us hope and give us new life and freedom. And I thank you for your love your love, especially for my friends here. I pray you continue to pour it out. Amen. Well, I have something for you. This is for each one of you. Kind of a reminder of uh, what Jesus did for us. Come on. There you go. Nope, they're not tattoos. That's, uh, sorry about that. Yeah. 
They're little cross necklaces. You might, you know. And these particular, these particular ones are actually made in Israel, right? Where, you're welcome. There you go. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and there you can have one too. Whoop! Well, well, they began. There you go. Ah. Oh, I actually left. I left two there because there's one for brother, one for sister. You guys have great. Well, that's what we're here about today. Is really to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, and uh, want to mention a couple of announcements. Uh, by the way, uh, some of you I see already discovered this, so I don't need to mention it for some of you, but the rest of you, there is a whole bunch of donuts in the fellowship hall. Yeah. Now. We're not. We're going. We're going to lock all of the doors. You cannot leave until all the donuts are gone. All right. But uh, no, just head over to the fellowship hall after we're done here. Take some time around table to be with friends and family, and uh, have some donuts. They're Krispy Kreme, by the way. If that means something to you, they're really, really good. Had some earlier. It's a great with great joy. And I call your attention to the front of connections. I hope that you, if you haven't picked one up already, that you will. To mention that the, uh, the elders have decided to hire Kelly Lipinski to, to become a ministry associate to work alongside of Stuart. Um, most of you know I'll be retiring early in the summertime, so Kelly's going to come in and come alongside Stuart during the interim time. She is graduating this year from, uh, from Princeton Theological Seminary. She's not ordained yet, so her, her role will be that to assist him as an associate in, uh, in ministry. There, there's another thing that's not mentioned in there about Kelly. And here it is. She's looking for housing. She's looking for a place to live uh, in our area. She's hoping to find, and I'll give you a, a two-bedroom apartment or guest house with basic amenities and somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1,500 a month. So if you have any clues or leads on that, get in touch with us here in the office and we can pass them on to Kelly uh, and hopefully get her settled as well. And just to, She really appreciates the hospitality and looking forward to being with us in the days ahead. Friday nighters will take place this coming what? Friday. Friday. Excellent. Excellent. Friday night, 6.30, over in Fellowship Hall. Um, and actually, my wife, Lissa, and I are going to take you, if you come there, on a tour of the UK and some of the talk about the, uh, the history of the Christian church in England and in Scotland and uh, Ireland, Wales, all of that. Have an opportunity to share some of our photography from our travels, but also some of the history that's there. And the f next week, not this coming week, but the following week, we're hosting the Interfaith Hospitality Network. And when we talk about IHN, that's what it stands for, Interfaith Hospitality Network. And I think Chris is back there going, yay, mention it. She's right back there, so you can see Chris afterward. In fact, she told me we're not even going to let you out of this room until you see her. But, uh, and we need some help in terms of people that are willing to bring in dinner, someone to stay overnight with our guests as a host, uh, and maybe drive them around. They need to get from here to the, uh, to the center as well. The elders have called for a congregational meeting, and that'll take place in two weeks on the 15th of April, following the 11 o'clock services, in order to elect new elders, deacons, and trustees. That bunch has been working really hard, and also to vote to concur with my request to... Uh, to retire, so I need your saying yes to that. <laughs> Two last announcements. Um, for those of you who know Gary and Nancy Bender, Nancy's mother passed away on uh, Thursday into Friday, and we are arrangements for her. I think are the coming, the end of this coming week, they're not nailed down yet. You can check here at the office. And the other was um, Franz Snyder died. Um, Franz passed away yesterday. Uh, Rather suddenly, he had, had a. He was here Thursday night for the Monday Thursday service. He had a stroke on Friday, and uh, yesterday morning uh, he he passed away. Arrangements for him have not been put together yet. I understand it's probably going to be a memorial service later in the month. So, check with us in the, during the week. Hopefully, we'll know uh, when that. But we do ask your you to be in prayer for Sheila and the family, as well as uh, the Bender family. Um, and her mom's name was Helen Fisher. I think that's all I've got. We've got, uh, you want to introduce the prayer stations? Sure. I can do it. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, 
We just talked about the empty tomb. We have a number of prayer stations. One is over here, we have an opportunity to express our prayers and to hold up people specifically using the, um, the letters of well-wishing. So you can sign those during this, this brief time of, of prayerfully moving around. Back here is our confession table. Probably the easiest way to think of that is um, as you're writing something down, it's kind of like we're putting it in the tomb with Jesus. And it stays there. When Jesus rose from the dead, the sins that he died for were paid. They're gone. They stay in the tomb. And that's the kind of thing. So if, imagine those, those waste baskets really as, as a tomb. We'll put it in there, and then we walk away from there realizing that we are free because of his forgiveness. Of course, we have our, uh, our area over here on this particular table that's an opportunity for you to write down a prayer request and put them on the prayer wall. And finally, I do want to call your attention to the, uh, to the offering box. And that is really our response. When the women went to the, to the tomb, they went bringing spices because they wanted to show their love for Jesus. They thought he was dead. We come to show our love for a living Christ as we come and bring our offerings. And so I invite you to do that as well. This is a time of prayerful movement would ask that we could indeed come into his presence with thanksgiving. Testify this love. 
Thanks, Martin. Amen. Our Redeemer lives. Amen. Well, we're going to look at one of the accounts of uh, our Redeemer's coming to life again, and that's in Luke 24, beginning with the first verse down through the 12th. Luke 24, 1 to 12. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they, that is the women, came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living? among the dead he is not here but has risen remember how he told you while was still in Galilee that the son of man must be handed over to sinners and crucified and on the third day rise again then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest now it was Mary Magdalene Joanna Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with him who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. And then he went home amazed at what had happened. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray for a moment. Lord Jesus, alive and living in our presence, we lift our hearts to you in praise and thanks. We pray that you will open your heart to our hearts, your mind to our minds, your word to us in all things. We might know you and become more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was once a son who left his homeland to take a job far, far away. At first, he kept in touch with all the folks back home, but then, over time, it became less and less, and the business of his new life began to, to get in the way, and so his contact with anyone at home was very rare, and eventually, it stopped altogether. He lost contact with his parents for many, many years. After a long time, he decided he would return home, and he went back to his homeland looking for his parents and wanting to honor them. He decided to go to the cemetery and place a large bouquet of flowers on their graves. So he scoured the internet and he went and looked back on 20 years of newspaper obituaries, but he found nothing. Initially saddened by his inability to to find his parents, he rekindled his thought and he said, I'm going to go look in the cemeteries. And so he went back to the area of his hometown and looked at all the cemeteries he knew of in around town and he didn't find them. And so discouraged, he abandoned all hope and went back overseas, devastated he couldn't find his parents. If only he had checked the phone book. Because his parents were right there. They were still living in the town he grew up in, but they had moved into a different neighborhood, into a condo. They had downsized, but they were still alive and well. You see, what he was doing was searching for the living in the dead. And that's a really a sad thing, that someone could be sorrowfully looking among the dead for someone who's still living, but that's exactly what the women were doing on Easter morning. And the angels ask, why do you seek the living among the dead? I don't know about you, but we really can't blame them for that. I mean, the last time they had seen Jesus, 36 hours before him, he was dead. And they had watched Joseph of Arimathea. They had watched uh, Nicodemus, you know, quickly wrap his body in linens and place it in the tomb. And there's one thing about dead people. They don't tend to change locations. Um, They don't move around a lot. Death is like that. It's final. It's the end of the line, period, end of story. And we say someone's dead. And so when the women go to the cemetery, they're looking for someone they think is dead. And to them, after they'd seen what they saw, 
It was the end of Jesus' story. And now they were coming back and they were mourning. What kind of feelings do we have when we, we go through mourning? What do, you, what do you feel when you're grieving? I'm asking you a question. <laughs> Sad, yes. What else? Sometimes angry. You feel lost. You can feel disoriented. Sometimes people feel numb. All those feelings begin to overwhelm you, and that's what they came to the cemetery with. They came much the way... Um, that we do. They were sad. They, they, they never going to see him again. They were sad that his life had come to such a tragic end. And they were sad because all the dreams that Jesus had inspired in them evaporated on the cross. And so they came, actually, they came to the cemetery looking for comfort, much like we do when we go visit the grave sites of those who are loved ones of ours. And in much the same way that we take flowers and place them on the, on the grave, they were taking the spices out of respect, out of love for the one that had died. They'd gone, and, and I can imagine if they're like we are, if I, when, when we go to visit my parents' um, graves and, and we're with my sister, when we do, we find ourselves remembering and telling stories. Do you remember when, oh, what about this? And I think they were looking forward to just simply being together and in honoring Jesus by telling the stories. Now, their plan was to anoint Jesus' body with the spices. That's a fairly common thing in that culture because they did not embalm bodies the way we do. And essentially, they had 24 hours to uh, put a body in the tomb. The spices were because in the hot Palestinian environment, bodies began to decay pretty quickly. They began to stink. And so really, this was an act of love. Now, although we could say this, although we could say that their faith died on the cross and even their hope died on the cross, the one thing it didn't was their love. That's what brought them to the cemetery, was their love for Jesus. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, when he talks about love, he concludes it this way. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It cannot last anything. He says, in fact, it's the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. Love brought the women to the tomb. They'd seen him on the, on the cross, but their love for him remained, and that's what brought them. However, what they did not expect to find, they found. The stone rolled away, and a couple of angels waiting for them when they ducked inside the tomb. They didn't expect that. What they expected to find, they did not find. Jesus' body wasn't there. Right where they knew it was, 36 hours earlier, it was gone. And like it would do if that same thing happened to you and I, they were perplexed, they were puzzled, they were even frightened by it all. And although it, at the first sight it says the angels frightened them, frankly, I think it was a good thing that the angels showed up. Because they could have been wondering for the whole day all around the cemetery saying, where, where is he? You know? And never found him because they were looking for the living among the dead. So the angels uh, show up and they, they give him this, this message about why do you seek the living among the dead? And I think that's, it's a great comment, a great question because many of us still seek the living among the dead. I think of scholars who study Jesus' words, who pour over uh, ancient biblical manuscripts, who do a great deal of archaeology, but don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Or we see people who wear crosses or crucifix around their neck or lapel as, an, as a piece of jewelry, but don't really believe in the living Christ. It's just a nice piece of jewelry. Frank Morrison was a man who was looking for Jesus among the dead. Morrison was a British journalist who lived early in the 20th century, and he was not a follower of Jesus. And like those who thought the story of the empty tomb and the angels declaring he has risen was nonsense, an idle tale, as the text says, Morrison thought the same. And so he had a brilliant idea. He thought of proving the resurrection never happened. He put his skills as a, as a research, his research skills as an investigative journalist to use. And he thought, I'm going to dig into history. 
I'm going to prove that Jesus never raised from the dead. He would do his research, then he'd write a book presenting the historical facts about Jesus and the events around his death. In other words, Morrison went looking for the living among the dead. But guess what? Like Peter in Luke 24, although Morrison was dubious and would say, I don't believe it when I hear it, when he began to look into it, he never found the dead. He found exactly what it says in Luke, verses 2 and 3. The stone rolled away, the body of Christ gone. He found the risen Christ, and he put his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Morrison later wrote his, his book, and it was called Who Moved the Stone? It was one of three books um, for me personally that made a lot of difference. Along with C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, John Stott's Basic Christianity, those three books played a significant role in my own coming to embrace the risen Christ as Lord and Savior. In his preface, Morrison says this, This study is in some ways so unusual and provocative that the writer thinks it desirable to state here very briefly how the book came to take its present form. In one sense, it could have taken no other, for it's essentially a confession, the inner story of a man who originally set out to write one kind of book and found himself compelled by the sheer force of circumstances to write another. It's not that the facts themselves altered, but they're recorded imperishably in the monuments and pages of human history. But the interpretation we put upon those facts underwent a change. Somehow, the perspective shifted, not suddenly as a flash of insight or inspiration, but slowly, almost imperceptibly, by the very stubbornness of the facts themselves. Morrison set out to write a book disproving the resurrection. Instead, he ended up writing one that became a Christian classic as for evidence of the resurrection. Morrison started looking for Jesus among the dead, but he never found them there, and we won't either. If you want to find Jesus this morning, you've got to look among the living. For the angel said to the woman, he is not here, he has risen. He's not among the dead, he's risen, and that makes all the difference in the world. Years and years ago, um, way back in the 1900s, I spent a couple of days on retreat with a friend of mine uh, at a place called Olmsted Manor. Olmsted Manor is in the, uh, the Allegheny National Forest in western Pennsylvania's McCain County. My friend, Mark Steimer, was our youth director at the church I was pastoring at that time. And when we got there, we decided we would just, you know, kind of loosen up and, and take a walk. And we saw an old cemetery across from Olmsted. So we went over there. Now, I don't know about you, but old cemeteries are fun. And we, we've seen a lot of really old ones in England. And part of what makes them fun are the epitaphs. You ever walk through some of those and read the epitaphs? You know, they, they could read something like this. In battle heroic and private life exceedingly beloved. In everything, the model of a Christian soldier. Or here's one that actually sometimes we see a lot of. Behold and see as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you must be. Prepare for death and follow me. There's some wisdom in that. Well, going through, the, we went through the cemetery, I remember, and, you know, kind of marvel at some of the old tombstones and the things they said. And as we were leaving, going through this iron gate, you know, the black rod iron gate kind of thing, I turned to Mark and said, so now that we've done that, um, what would you like in your epitaph? And Mark was always quick on the uptake, and he said this, just four words, he is not here. And I thought, right on, Mark, right on. You see, Paul reminds us in Thessalonians, we don't grieve like the rest of humanity who have no hope as if the grave were the last word. It isn't. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Christ, Paul says in Thessalonians. And Peter adds this, because Christ was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. The future starts now. That's kind of the message, but it talks about we have hope, and that's what it is. For my friend Mark, 
to say on his tombstone he loved it to say he is not here is to declare with the apostle Paul that since Christ has been raised from the dead there is no life that we have to worry about beyond the grave it's there I don't have to ask the question what happens after there is life beyond the grave because Christ was defeated he defeated death on Easter you ever realize that we sing at Christmas is we can sing this only because of Easter good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice now ye need not fear the grave peace peace Jesus Christ was born to save and he rose to save us Friday morning I got an email from a dear friend uh, and I mentioned a moment ago that her mother had passed away in the night before that email ended this way she's now at peace and that's only true because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and her mom was one of his it's a great hope realized by her mother and a great comfort for the family Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians if Christ wasn't raised then all we're doing is wandering around in the dark as lost as ever and those who've died hoping in Christ and the resurrection are indeed lost if, if all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years we're a pretty sorry lot but the truth is that Christ has been raised up the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries that's those of us who follow him the first of a long line who leave the cemeteries now one other thing that could say to us the resurrection is all about someday by and by but the good news of the resurrection is not just for after we've lived this life and gone on to the next it deeply affects how we live on this side of the grave as well it does Mark Golley is the uh, editor in chief of Christianity Today and he wrote an article that when I saw the headline, when I saw the introduction part of it, caught my attention because he says that the most astonishing Easter miracle is not that Jesus rose from the dead. Astounding as that is. He writes this. The great miracle that the gospel proclaims is not merely that Christ lived bodily after the crucifixion, but that he lives dynamically in us today. The resurrection is one with the ascension and the Pentecost. We cannot grasp the meaning of the resurrection in isolation because those two other events display an even greater miracle. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Isn't that incredible? If he'd not been raised from the dead, he wouldn't be living in us. Golly goes on. There are a few phrases more important in the teaching of Paul that his repeated affirmation that we are in Christ. He uses that phrase over 200 times in his letters. Christians do not merely believe truths about Christ. We do not merely trust in God's forgiveness given at the cross and that Jesus rose bodily from the grave. The most distinctive mark of Christians is this. We are people in whom the resurrected Christ lives. That's what makes us different. Because Christ is risen, those of us who follow him are those in whom Christ lives by the indwelling spirit. And that, friends, is what unites a church. Our church, any church, all churches. It's Christ in you. It's Christ in all of us together, the hope of glory. The most remarkable thing about every one of us is that the Holy Spirit lives in you. If you follow Christ, he lives in you. Um, and that's what makes you so valuable. There are three things that make you valuable before God and other people. The first one is you are made in the image of God. If Picasso painted, had a painting and wrote his name on the bottom, that would be incredibly valuable because he made it. Now, if I, wrote, if I painted something and wrote my name on the bottom, you wouldn't pay a plug nickel for it. Second, you are incredibly valued because of the price paid for you, which was the blood of Jesus Christ highest price ever paid for anything the third thing that makes us valuable is the indwelling Holy Spirit why is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue a special address why it's where the president lives that's the only thing that sets it aside you are special because the God of the universe in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit lives in you 
Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not worth something. There are three reasons you are incredibly valuable. And if the resurrection wasn't true, that would not be true. And so it's not because we agree on certain doctrines and behaviors, as important as they are, that unites us as a church, nor is it because we have a lot in common culturally that we're unified. Unity on those things, is, it's well and good. But it's still external to us. The Holy Scriptures proclaim God's people are those in whom the Spirit lives, and that is the very core of our being. We each are fully identified with Christ and therefore fully identified with each other. It's because of Christ's indwelling presence that you and I are one. Everything else we can say about ourselves pales next to that. And that's the corporate present effect of the Holy Spirit, of the resurrection of Jesus. On a more personal note, Paul says this in Ephesians 1. He prays for you and I. He prays like this. He prays that we, we would realize the great hope to which God calls us, the magnificence and the splendor of the inheritance promised to us, and the tremendous power for those who believe, which is the same divine power God showed when he raised Christ from the dead. The power that God shows in raising Christ from the dead is your inheritance. That power is what enables Paul to say, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances may be. I know how to live when things are tough. I know how to live when things are prosperous. In general and in particular, I have found the secret to facing either poverty or plenty. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. Or as sometimes it's put, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's because the resurrection power is yours. That strength is ours to the indwelling Christ within us. As the Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ and I want to experience the power of his resurrection. You do, if you've put your faith in Christ. And so on this resurrection day, there's an invitation and a challenge in this text for all of us. For those who kind of go through each day looking for life in all the wrong places, the challenge comes in the angelic question, why do you seek the living among the dead? The dead world cannot give you life and life abundantly. Only the risen and living Savior can do that. He's the bread of life, the spring of living water that wells up to eternal life. He is life itself, says the text, the one whose word and ways are full of the Spirit and life. He is the one whom to know is eternal life. It's all about that. If you're a skeptic, like the apostles were who didn't believe it when they heard that Jesus was risen, here again the, the angel's invitation in Matthew 28. Come and see. Check it out, just like Frank Morrison did. Examine the evidence for yourself. Perhaps you, like the apostle John, will dare to walk into the empty tomb, like the apostle Peter as well, to see the empty tomb, to see and believe, just like I did 50 years ago. Read Morrison's book, Read Lewis's Mere Christianity, or even go to Josh McDowell's work, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Check it out. It's okay to be a skeptic. Check it out. And for those who are followers of Christ and proclaim He is risen, there's a daily challenge to live like you believe what you believe. Who knows the incredible things that could happen in a family, a church, a community if we lived like Jesus really was risen from the dead. Do you really believe what you believe? That the risen Lord Jesus Christ lives within each of us and all of us who are his own? For all those in Christ and in whom Christ dwells and are one in him, united and empowered, we have a new life in him. There's a challenge here for each of us, no matter where we are. Can we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus who gives us hope and life and for his spirit that lives within us and binds us together and gives us power to live this life that's before us even in a tough world may you be glorified and father may you speak to the hearts and continue to speak to the hearts of each one of us that we might pick up the challenge that is ours and follow you in Christ's name we pray amen 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 I wanted to share one thing before we um, sing this last song and share it together. Um, Mike, who's over there on the bass, is, uh, has one more week with us. He's getting transferred to Dallas. 
So one, two, we're really pretty sad about that. <laughs> but, so Mike, by the way. Yeah, yeah he, he was sad too. Yeah. But um, we're, I, I just want to, if you take the time to just thank him for the time that he's spent here. He's been really blessing. He's a great brother in the Lord. So thank you. Thank Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, my man. <laughs> you take the hand of one who's near you and pray for those whose hands you hold that God would bless them and keep them I'm not going to ask for a blessing on the donuts but they're still blessed you make, make sure to go get a couple but let's pray Lord Jesus risen Lord in our midst 
I pray that you continue to touch each of my friends, each one here, with your love, your joy, your hope, and your power. May we walk in your peace, says the Prince of Peace, this day and always. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.